Like many young boys, I was probably drawn to the martial arts for all the wrong reasons. But as fate would have it, I was very, very blessed by finding the right teachers. This quickly changed my life and the quality of my life by understanding the laws of cause and effect and how they impact other people. Martial arts then became a path to cultivate compassion and understanding and help me realize how we can all help one another. Then and only then, Aikido became a perfect vehicle to develop the physical self and the spiritual man simultaneously. And it got to the point in my life where anyone I would meet, I would always look at them and understand that this person is my mother, my father, my brother, my sister, all my family. You never know how long the battle's going to be. You always have to be ready. My name is Ben Dang, and I've been studying with uh, Steven Seagal Sensei, or uh, Taka Sensei, for um, around 14 years now. My name is Larry Reynosa, and I've been training with Sensei Steven Seagal since 1983. I discovered Seagal Sensei in the late 70s in Japan. I went to Japan to find an Aikido teacher, and then I went and saw his dojo in Osaka, and I was thoroughly impressed. But I was a little concerned about the idea of coming 13,000 miles to study with an American. I was looking for a practical. So ultimately, I went back to Seagull Sensei's Tenshin Dojo. I'll never forget the first day I met him because he was wearing a plaid shirt, blue jeans, cowboy boots, and had very long sideburns. My name is Aikido is I had a friend. He said, oh, you got to go to Steven Seagal. He's this American guy who went to Japan and trained over there and got really high ranking and he came back here and he has a school. My name's Garrett Green. I, uh, I study Aikido for about the last uh, 10 years. First impression, as I'm sure most people say, uh, he's very big, <laughs> he's very tall, um, big hands and uh, centered. a presence that, you know, even if, even somebody that doesn't study Aikido can can feel. There was a magnificence about him as well. He was one of the first Anglos to be given credentials to teach Aikido in Japan. When he would walk in, he'd feel someone entered the room. When he spoke, when he shook your hand, when he looked into your eyes, there was an incredible truth there. And immediately I was interested. I feel like I was very fortunate. I was in the right place at the right time. Tenshin Dojo is in Osaka, in Juso. Uh, Juso is uh, outside, it's on the outskirts of Osaka. The dojo population was probably three quarters Japanese, one quarter European and Australian. 
非常にリアルな本当の戦いというものを映像の中でも完全にいつも意識しているというリアルファイトに徹しているというのはまあ単に見せ物だけじゃないというのが一つの彼の特徴だと思いますね。Everybody seemed to respect each other, regardless of. That was the nice thing about Japan. There's a great deal of respect. It wasn't fun. It wasn't a lot of laughs. You know, there, a lot of times you go to dojo and there'll be people joking around, laughing, talking. Not a lot of talking. As soon as you heard Sensei's tread coming up the stairs, and it was easy to identify, you could tell that the level of attention and the level of seriousness changed. There was no more. Talking more, it was like everybody knew that they better pay attention. He did all the talking. I think that Sensei, you know,、uh, as an Anglo,、uh, I think that in order to be treated as an equal, my understanding is that he actually had to be better.、Uh, I think that there were people that came in and challenged him. He didn't have to be tough; he just was. You don't get to deal with the man to start with. You got to prove yourself against his students first. I had no idea what he was doing. He's very fast, like lightning. You'd sit there and you'd watch him do a technique, and he did it so fast that I had no idea what he just did. What, what did he do? It was too fast. I couldn't see it. And then he did these great flips and different kinds of falls. And, and then I saw everybody else doing it. And they didn't do it anything like the way he did it. Every move, every gesture,、uh, how he taught class, how he performed the techniques, was powerful. には文武両道というのがあって、両方が均等に発達していかないことにはいけないというふうに思っております。先生は a pretty form he taught and when he did speak he taught in Japanese was pretty technical. He would always stress the basics. It was pretty detailed and it was pretty technical.
That was really my first exposure to Aikido in any way. I was training with someone that was teaching a very practical Aikido form. It should be um, practical. If you practice on a practical level, then you can take that form and you can dance with it. But if you are trained in a dance form and you suddenly need to use it practically, oh, you might be disappointed. You know, you don't take a knife to a gunfight, basically, is one of the things that I was taught by him. The major difference is that I saw where so many other people struggled to explain, to articulate Aikido. They really had a struggle with that because what they said and what they did didn't equate. I've heard this conversation many times. This is what you do if you get punched. And then to see the st punch stop in front of the nose. Or this is what you do when you get hit from the side and then see this hit stop. And then this is what you do if you get choked and yet I don't see people choking. So there was a real inconsistency in the teaching. I got with Takasensei and all of a sudden he said, well this is what you do if you get punched. And all of a sudden you would see that fit coming right at you and it'd go right at you. If you didn't move, you would get punched. That was the truth. That's something we could really relate to because, in fact, if we didn't move, we'd get punched. Sliding up sliding from the chest like that. There we see that. Sliding up the chest. Steven Seagal's Aikido is more applicable to on the street applications. A lot of us uh, join and learn his style of Aikido because we want to have confidence. I guess the Japanese word is kibishi, which really translates roughly as severe, and definitely Sigo Sensei's form is, you know, it's, it's severe. Uh, not severe in terms of people getting injured, but it is a form that, that works. Does this work? In a situation, if somebody comes and attacks you, okay. would this work?
There was a great lesson there that I keep reiterating is that truth of that honesty and training. Because without the honesty and training, there is nothing. That's what's great about um, Taka Sensei's Aikido. The image of him that I remember the most would be the way he would start class in front of the showman. And he would bow to the showman, turn around and bow to us. It was powerful. Not just a powerful image, but a powerful feeling. There's two levels where, you know, Tiger Sensei trains, and that's one with a beginner, and he's very kind, he's gentle, he's uh, incredible. He has the ability to deal with you at a level that you can understand. I had no experience with martial arts at all. He would often talk about te sabaki, ashi sabaki, hand position, foot position. He'd do the technique with you. He'd explain things about what you were doing wrong. He'll let you know about your openings. He'll let you know about your holes. Some classes, he, he didn't talk at all. He would just come in, do techniques. Hi, Dozo. We'd get up and do them. Pay close attention to his hand movements. He would walk around to the, each of the different couples doing it, and then he'd give you tips, pointers. No, no, safest place is where? Behind. Or to the side. First, one person's the nage, or the thrower, that gets to practice the technique that's presented by the teacher. And then, of course, the uke is the one that, you know, is on the receiving end that gives that person the opportunity to train. Then they switch those roles. Well, I got you. All that stuff he talks about with kicks and, and, and avoiding overhead strikes, it's all very precise. That's why that hand comes. I'll start out from here. And when I raise it, I raise my elbows to the top of the hand. 
you'd get individual attention. That he was quite capable of doing this is taking you just a notch beyond what you're capable of. Get your feet out of there! Get your feet out of there! Get your feet! As my level of understanding climbs a notch, he has more notches. That creates confidence. He always like wanted you to do a lot of ukemi, and that's how you'd learn. To learn how to fall, how to conquer the fear of falling, how to not panic in a fall is more valuable from a self-defense point. I mean, we will all fall down. It's more likely that you will fall than it is that you will be attacked, ever. So learning how to, how to deal with the ground is, I think, a valuable tool. If you did a fall wrong, you know, it hurt for days. Tukemi is to provide the honest attack that might occur as a possibility on the street. We used a lot of tape in those days. The tatami were very hard, and that's where we trained. You learn a lot from taking the falls. Your ability to fall precedes your ability to throw. That means that you have to be on top of your ukemi. That means you've got to be there, which is really what it's all about anyway. I learned how to fall really well, because the mats were really, really hard. You know, when Sensei calls you up to take Ukemi, the hair on the back of your neck starts to raise a little bit. You're like, okay, you get inside this guy's reach, you better be paying attention. I have more than once been caught thinking that he was going one direction when he was going another. It can be downright painful. The opportunity to take ukemi from the sensei is like, you know, not that many people get that opportunity, so I was very grateful. Anybody that has been on the mat with Taka Sensei knows that there is truth in Aikido. It's undeniably uh, powerful, effective, and when you stand in the truth, you know, sometimes that's brutal. He's yelled at me, yeah, definitely. This is the moment of truth. You get out of your car in the parking lot, you're sleeping in bed with your wife, and somebody comes in through the window. This is the time right now. And the guys who are up here are giving you permission to go for it. And if they can't take that, they can't be here. They won't be here. They'll go somewhere else. When you're absolutely out of gas and you and you can't breathe and, and he's yelling at you to get back up again and, and smacking you or throwing people on top of you or saying get him or you're up against the wall. Now you got your feet, the most important part. 
Now you got your feet. You're just going to turn over, turn over. And get on your knees and lift yourself up. Turn over. I would rather suffer his anger than his indifference. There you go. Get out. Move, 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 move. That's where you feel the most, the most love. It's weird because you feel bad when he yells at you, but it, it definitely came out of love. You know, I never felt he hates me. He, he's mad at me. He's not. There's nothing in it that, that, that you feel threatened by him. Okay. I was more mad at myself for not being able to do what he wanted me to do. You just want to do it. You'd always feel that he's doing it for your your benefit. If he yelled at you, that would make you come up to where you needed to be. But he did it out of love. The best advice he ever gave me was to not be female. Don't think of yourself as less or weaker or not able to do the things that the guys are doing. Don't make that the reason that you can't do it.練習してる時にどうしても力でこられて悔しい思いをする時がたまにあるんですけれどもでもわざをやっぱり自分なりにきちっと技をかけていけば男性男性が相手でも十分あの技になりますしかえって男性にとってあのこんな私細いですしあの
he was showing me something and I looked at him and he was getting frustrated with my inability to do it and I looked at him and I said I'm trying and he looked at me and he said trying he said stop trying just do it trying is cerebral trying is crap students that have come up under him understand you don't judge you just do you just worry about doing your job through the physical aspect of hard training your mind gets set in a certain way at that point of physical exhaustion something happens to you mentally something happens to you spiritually and um, I want to say growth happens I want to say understanding but it's more than that it almost builds you from the inside it makes you stronger it makes you look at yourself from the inside it makes you uh, see yourself your weaknesses your point of pain threshold at what point do you break mentally at what point do you say that's it I had enough and it pushes you beyond that point I felt this that kind of training would get you to the point where later on you're old, you can't do that stuff, but you're, you're a rock inside. If there's one person that I could say has an amazing will, it's Steven Seagal Sensei. I got a flyer. There was an open house given by Steven Seagal. I could make it, but I sent a couple of my students down to uh, check it out. I think some of the people that were watching the demonstrations were a little bit astounded because, um, you know, he would do his, what I call, thunder and lightning show at that point. A couple of my students came back very, not only just excited, but nervous. And uh, they virtually told me that he had taken some guy and just smashed him all over the mat and that damn near killed him. And as soon as he said that, it was very interesting because my interest peaked. Somebody doing real Aikido? It was shortly after that, of course, that I invited him to my West Side Dojo in Ventura. And he taught the very first seminar there, public seminar uh, in, in America. But most all these seminars that we, we've had in the past, that the one main and common thread that's from all their conversation is that I can't believe how approachable he is. He's so easy to talk with on the mat. He's very, very, very gentle, very, very uh, soft-spoken. He can be the most gentle, he can be extremely gentle. And he can also be extremely uh, dangerous. The people that are the most capable of deadly waza are also the most capable of being gentle. How do you have the, uh, the loving, harmonious, uh, flowing, caring, gentle side of Aikido and how does that relate to what we do in the dojo when we beat the hell out of each other and, and it's very rigorous and, and seemingly cruel? You find out that you just, you can be a nice guy and yet be a lethal weapon. The spiritual side kind of came out of that. Life and death is that exact, you know, that exact same, uh, that contrast of that you can't have one without the other. And, and to embrace one, you need to embrace both. To accept one, you need to have, you need to have both. If you train enough, you get both sides of the coin. You train to the point of exhaustion, physical exhaustion, where your body can't go anymore. Your muscle refuse to um, listen to the brain. It was just about jumping in there and, and training as hard as you could. And, and he would take us till we just literally couldn't get up anymore. It was just a matter of tape up and get on the mat. It's beyond stamina. You need to be on your toes. You need to be the best that you can be at all times. You have to be uh, balanced. You have to be on it. It's a constant process. And that's another thing, is you, you just realize the more you learn, the less you know. And each time you get a little bit closer, you realize how far you still got to go. The more talent you have, the more demanding it's going to be. There's a certain kind of trust and, and standard in, in anybody that's come up under him. He knows and expects excellence. He is 
not interested in compromise. He expects the best from you. He expects perfection from you. He expects perfection from himself, thus he expects perfection from his student. He has a certain standard of what a black belt martial artist should be, especially in Aikido. And that's somebody that has true skills and has been trained well in the basics. I think it must have been like three or four years before I took the black belt test the first time. Maybe even five years. The Don represents a, a internal, un, an internalized understanding of the mechanics. One of the reasons that he would run a full class before the test was so that he would drain your battery so that he could see what, what do you have when you got nothing left. How, how, how deep can you dig? And basically he shut the blinds, locked the doors, and it was, uh, it was pretty interesting. It was very intense. And he, and he always said it's so simple. You know, it's so simple, but it's so hard. I mean, I tested twice and didn't get it. So, and, I, and other people tested two and three and four times. So it wasn't an automatic thing. We say, if you can make it 15 seconds, 15 seconds, and that's how, you know, intense these tests were. I have seen few people pass the test their first time. And in fact, I would go so far as to say that not passing the test your first time is part of the test. So you, you experience this little bit of a peace, the calm before the storm, very peaceful up until the time where he says go. I need you. The Don test represents the opportunity to show that you have internalized the practice. And the run dory is the main thing of the black belt test. This was a lesson in fear and overcoming your fears. The run dory is where the test, that's where the test lies. Basically, in Tiger Sensei's way of thinking, that this is the standard of Shodan of the black belt. Rondori. Rondori is a multiple attack, multiple person attack. You sit on one side of the dojo, three guys are facing you, and when he says, Hajime, begin, they just run at you full speed and just try to take you down. In my mind, it's sort of the essence of the form. That is to say, the idea of the form is to be able to deal with more than one attacker at a time. 
I mean, if you're dealing one-on-one, -on -one, and certainly we train, that's how we train, but the idea is to finish your form ready for another attack. That is to say, finish in a balanced position. The reason for that is, I mean, O-Sensei was a product of, of sword culture, and sword culture was very seldom one-on-one. -on -one. Sword culture was uh, more often more than one attacker against a single opponent. So you have to put your forms together. That is to say, you have to blend with one attack coming at you, uh, neutralize that attack, and then immediately be prepared to deal with the next attacker. Basically, you let go of everything that you think you know. It's, it's an exercise in freeing yourself up of thinking about all these things, of thinking about how your, your knee hurts or how, uh, how this last time this guy clubbed me from the side or, or any of that. If you think, it's too late. If you take the time to make a decision, it's too late. If you do, if you hang on to that and you stand in, you think you know, or in other words, your own arrogance or egotism, if you want to call it, if you stand in that, you'll get smashed. And that's the value of the Rondori because basically when they says go, these are three guys that are one breath away, away from being in reality on the street. I mean, there's been situations, I think, on the street that I would, I wouldn't want, I would want rather than this. You can't even, be, you can't be thinking fear, not fear, anything, because any thought that goes through your head, it's immediately visible in your body, physically. It's, uh, you know, a matter of, of uh, relieving yourself of having to worry about anything and uh, being able to to deal with whatever situation they can throw at you, whatever three minds and the dynamics of three people coming at you at full speed can do. Ron Dory is your first opportunity to get a clue about the infinite number of ways to attack you, to grab you, to punch you, to kick you. And when I say that, I mean that they were free to do that. They could punch, grab, kick, spit, bite, whatever they wanted to do. Of course, on the other hand, you were allowed to do that too. He didn't even care so much in the Rondori if you even did a technique. He didn't care what it was you had to do. Whatever it was, as far as he was concerned, that was it. You just have to do, and you have to do it very quickly. The, the main thing is being there in the moment and dealing with nothing but what's there. When you've got more than one person coming at you, and they are all coming at you with the same intent and simultaneously, then you don't want to get captured, and you certainly don't want to be taken to the ground. In that instant, he wants you to think, this is life and death. These guys are going to kill you. They get you, you're dead. Once they hit you, I mean, you realize this is for real. And, and it gives you an opportunity to understand what letting go is all about. The world doesn't change for anybody. I don't care if you're a woman. I don't care if you're a baby. The world doesn't change. The evil doesn't change out there. All those things that we have to face don't change. Okay? The only way we can teach anybody is by being real. All right? If you can stand up, that's good. If he falls, we'll make him stand up again and again and again. All right? So, there's no favorites in the dojo. There's no women. There's no men. There's no old people. There's no young people. When you come up for showdown, everything's the same. It was the most serious thing I ever experienced. And I mean, even thinking about it, I get a, just a knot in my stomach. Somebody that's, that's 120 pounds is going to have a tougher time dealing with these three uh, Mack trucks that are coming after. You know, it doesn't matter. It's what's, what's inside, what you, what you have, uh, your character. And that's what's going to come out in the test. And you're sitting there and you're trying to like prepare and you're just, you're trying to relax your body and you're trying to just clear your mind so that everything is, whatever it is that comes to you can deal with it. It's hard to do. It's hard to relax. It's hard to breathe because you've just been doing techniques and you're a little bit winded and, um, and he can say, how'd you make it any time? He'll be talking like this and all of a sudden go, how'd you make it? You know, and you're supposed to go. So you can't even really be listening to what he's saying. I'm always looking at them as one. See? Now 
watching and watching. And if I have to leave, I have to run. I'll, I'll, I'll stop and start. I'll come in here, make him think he's got me. Come this way. <laughs> <laughs> but as they grab me, one thing I'll never do is let them have me inside. But I'll always try to do is keep that myself. Going to the ground is uh, not the option. That's not what he's looking for. You take the test and it's over in a second. If you could stay up, if you could control the three people, if you got to the point where he felt you were controlling those people, then you passed. I mean, that was it. You know, you went through the fire and you came out the other side. Uh, at the end of the day is that uh, poor Matsova got his tooth knocked out and another got his shoulder separated and I had gotten poked in the eye. and It was amazing. We were all over that dojo. We had jumped over the office furniture. We had come under the student benches and chairs were knocked out of the way and it was just it was just incredible that as real as you know it could possibly get it's hard it's the hardest thing i ever did randori uh, the three-man attack teaches you that with your will you can make anything happen it teaches you that no matter how bad a situation can get it teaches you to face those situations with the right mental attitude the right state of mind when you have that mind that in your mind that at any moment your life could end but that you don't care it wouldn't bother you if your life ended you cannot be afraid to die basically is the mindset you have to have the practice around dory kind of allows you not to think about your, your limitations and it allows you to go uh, beyond where you thought you could go before and that is you know what everybody needs to be successful anyway if you practice that that philosophy of letting go and uh, not limiting yourself in your real life, um, then you have no limitations. Akumade jibun wa chisai inda. Jibun wa akumade uchu no hitotsu nanda toyu sono hirikisa o shitta toki ni honto no tsuyosa o kanjiru to omemas. My life has been influenced a great deal by Taki Sensei's Aikido teachings. The not accepting your own limits. If somebody were to ask me what's the most valuable lesson I've ever learned from Steven Seagal, it's that it's possible to be the lessons of Aikido. I was raised by him, so I, I feel that he is the source. Everything that he does is powerful. Mentor, master. Charismatic, loving, um, a great teacher. Warrior, he personifies that, in my mind, the, the, uh, the spirit of a warrior. I'm inspired today by this man simply to become a better human being. He ha changed my life. My. Uh, my uh, introduction to him and my training by him has changed my life. Show me what you got when you got nothing left. Show me what you got.